glory, glory, glory. Father God, we do love you. Lord, and we are so grateful that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, we thank you that even before you formed each and every one of us in our mother's womb, God, that you knew us. Lord, that you had a purpose and a plan and a vision for each and every one of us, for our lives, for our existence, God. And Lord, we know that in all of these things, no matter what my purpose is on earth, no matter my my part that I play in your plan, God, it is all to bring you glory and to bring you honor. Lord, we ask this morning as we transition from worship in song to worship in giving and reading the word and in fellowship, Lord, that you would bless us with your presence, that you would bless us with a, another measure of your spirit, God, that we could grow one with another in love and fellowship and in good works. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I kind of felt like those songs just led one right into another. Felt good. Yes. I like it. Amen. Now let me tell you something else. Now I like Chris Tomlin's song, and it makes you get all in there. But those first two songs, if you don't know, those are songs from the 1700s, okay? And they got a whole lot of theological truth in there, okay? Got a whole lot of theological truth in there. I love them, man. I found, a, I found a site, okay, just for you guys, and it's going to be great. It's called, uh, I can't even remember now. Something <laughs> Hymn is on YouTube, but it's all kinds of different hymns with, some of them have modern music, some of them just have piano accompaniment, but then we can all sing them together. I like that. I like that idea. How about that? Well, we can do that. I don't have a problem. Are you talking about this singing? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, like a sing spray. Brad would be down for that. He'd probably DJ the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, he said, we already got a DJ. Matt, look, Matt's looking at me all crazy like, why are you trying to get my job away? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm excited, okay? We got some announcements. Number one. Number one. 5.30 p.m. Church tonight, amen? amen? It's always my first announcement on Sunday morning. We got church tonight, okay? For those of you who don't know, we got church on Sunday night too, okay? Uh, number two. Number two announcement. Wednesday. Women have a prayer breakfast here at the church at 10 a.m. Is it 10 a.m.? 10, 10, right? 10 a.m. every Wednesday morning. So if you ain't involved, you probably ought to think about being involved. Amen? Uh, also, what's that? You don't have to bring anything. And you don't have to bring anything if you don't want to. Just come show up. That's more important. Amen? Uh, also, Wednesday night service, 5.30 p.m., okay? Uh, let's get to some announcements because I'm really excited about this one. And since Carmen told me I had to say it when the camera was on, I'm going to say it again. We have been saving up to get money to put rubber on a two-story or three-story roof. And we, this, this, this past week on Tuesday, we got an envelope in the mail that put us $600 over our goal. So we are now $5,600 for our building fund to put the roof on the three-story building. I don't know if you guys realize this, but we get that whole thing watertight, and then we can start doing all kinds of stuff in that part of the building, okay? That means, oh, all, all, sorry. All children, eight and under, are dismissed to go to Children's Church. 
Carmen had to sh come to the front door to make sure where all these kids were supposed to be in there is at. Amen. Hey, it's good to have children's church. Amen. Amen. But I want to say again, we are six hundred dollars over our goal. That means we can start doing all kinds of stuff in that building as soon as we get it watertight. Amen. We can start renovating rooms. We can start cleaning stuff out. We can start taking down false ceilings. We can get everything ready to start building. Amen. It all starts somewhere. What's that? Right. No, I will. I'm going to keep you guys posted. We want to get the rubber, and then we're going to want a warm day to get up there and, and put it on. And we can fit, you know, a good six or eight people on that big roof to pour rubber. Amen? So I'll let everybody know when we're ready to do that, okay? Uh, second of all, announcement. This is my other announcement, okay? I think this is three. Number three. Number three announcement. I'm praying about this. I want you guys to pray about it, okay? Because right now, I know a lot of Christians who quote a lot of Bible verses. But I also know a lot of Christians who quote a lot of Bible verses out of context. Because they don't even know what they're reading, okay? And the idea that I can just pull a Bible verse completely out of the context it was spoken in and apply it however I want is the wrong kind of Bible study, okay? Well, that's, not, that's not how we read the Bible, okay? That's not how anybody should read the Bible. I can't just take a verse and make it say what I'm wanting it to say. I have to read it in context, okay? So I'm, I've been praying about this. I've been going over it in my mind and I think that Either we're going to have to start a Sunday school class, or uh, or, or or we don't need, we don't have to call it Sunday school class. We can call it whatever you want, but a place where people learn how to read the Bible for what it says, amen. Amen? amen, and not what they want it to say. Because we are we are here to learn from one another as we all follow this, amen. 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 And we all need to be on the same page in following this. Yeah, Amen. You know what people want it to say? You can do whatever you want. That's what they want it to, to say. They want it to say, it's okay for you to do whatever you want. I want to do whatever I want. Yeah, whatever I want. And just me, not yeah. you. Not you. Just yeah, me. it doesn't have to apply to you, just me. Yeah. No, no, the Word of God does not get divided up like that. Amen. What it means for me, it means for you. Amen. And what it means for you, it means for me. And Amen. we need to get back to, I think, proper biblical exegesis where we're learning to read the Bible for Amen. what it says. Amen. 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 We really need that. Amen. Amen. Not saying our church really needs that. Everybody really needs Amen. that. Amen. As a pastor, I need that. As a pastor, it encourages me when people say, you know, I actually read this, and, you know, I used to think this, but the Bible said this, and I said, I'm going to believe what the Bible says. That's, that's the kind of what you should be hearing. Not, I got a word, and then I'm going to go try to find a Bible verse that backs what I think I found up. You see what I mean? That's not how we do Bible reading. That's not how we come to understand God's word. Okay, you read it, and it says what it says, and then the Spirit reveals you the truth that's in it, Amen. not the truth that you want or the truth that you're looking for out there. Amen. Amen. Truth, all truth, comes from right here. Amen. And you can't be of a like mind and read a verse different. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta be on the same page. So I want to try to get all of us on the same page in reading the Bible and understanding the Bible. Amen. So be praying about that. I don't know when I want to start that, but I'm praying about it right now, okay? About when to do it, how to do it, all that stuff, okay? Uh, we had men's prayer breakfast, me and Greg, and it was awesome, okay? Me and Greg. <laughs> you supposed to be. I didn't know if I was supposed to come or not, so it was men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a men's prayer breakfast. It's supposed to be for men, okay? Love you, uh, love you ladies. 
You got to do this once a week, okay? <laughs> twice a week, probably. Twice, we are twice a week. Right, right. Uh, well, I'd like to brag on my mama for just a minute. Brag right on your mom. Uh-huh. And a lot of that time her and I've talked over the past several years that about whether or not she's actually reading a scripture or if she's ever read the Bible through. That's here and there, neither here nor there. But come January this year she determined she was gonna read the Bible through. That was the first year. We're not what, two weeks into January, she's already through Amos. Amen. Oh, she reads fast. I, I don't even know how she does it. Okay, like, she can put a book away in a day. That Carmen day. sent her home with a bag full of books one time, and in between a uh, week worth of service, she brought all the books back. I stand corrected. She just corrected me. She's two pages short of Matthew. Okay, so she's in Malachi. The entire Old Testament in two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Right See, on. good luck. Y'all got a long way to go to catch grandma, okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That, that's something I'm praying about. I want you guys to be praying about it. Uh, I do I do want to be praying for certain people. I have a couple friends that are possibly going to start coming to church here, so be praying for them. I really, really am excited if they start coming to church here. It's going to be a big thing for me personally. I will enjoy it. Plus, it'll be another man in the church that is actually, you know, knowledgeable about the Bible, engaged in the Bible, engaged in uh, what God wants to do in his church. Amen. Uh, uh, second of all, I just like having new people too, baby. Uh, be praying for those people who haven't been able to come back due to the whole COVID thing. Please be in prayer for Rick and Whitney. Uh, the Lord keeps the Lord hasn't let me let them be, okay? Every week, I'll message them at least once a week. I'll text them. I'll give them a Bible verse. I'll send them a link for one of our podcasts or videos or whatever. You know what I mean? And I'm praying for them, man. They, they got such a heart for the Lord, and God's done such a great work keeping their family together and, and bringing them through some stuff that they've really been on my heart, and I want you all to pray for them also, okay? Because I love them and I, you know, I miss them, but I understand because of their work, they can't, you know, be around people or whatnot, okay? So let's pray COVID goes away so we can have Rick and Whitney back, amen? Uh, be praying for uh, the York family, Michael and Judy are still in quarantine. Uh, I believe uh, somebody else up, uh, Andalee is in quarantine. Uh, be praying for Andalee. I'm not sure if Pearl's in quarantine Ben, if oh she's okay, not okay, okay, I'm just making sure. Not together anymore. Yeah, they're they're arguing. They're on out right now. Oh uh, well, we definitely need to pray for them then, Amen. right? Yeah, definitely yeah, need yeah, to pray yeah. for them that they're on the outs. We need to pray for them that they get out of there, get out of the ditch, and get back on the road. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Uh, before I do, I want to remind you that the offering baskets are right up here. Uh, we will start passing these again. Okay, I'm just letting you know. Uh, there's some people like, oh, you know, there was, I went to a pastor's meeting and they were all excited that they could change things and, oh, they didn't have to pass the offering plate anymore. I don't see nothing wrong with passing the offering plate. Ain't nothing wrong with it, okay? Matter of fact, normally what that meant is two other people in the church that didn't really get, get to do anything or be engaged got to do something else, right? So. That kind of thing is pretty important to have people engaged and feel like they're a part of something. Amen. And and I don't I think we I don't think we should be doing less and less stuff at church. I think we should be doing more and more stuff at church. Amen. Get people more and more engaged, not less. We want more. Amen. Uh, and that's that's where I'm at personally. Is we're we're never gonna be uh, we're never gonna create an environment where people feel like they can be engaged if we don't let them be engaged. Amen. That's why we have open mics. I don't have signed people. You know what I mean? That's why I've got a whole room full of mics. If other people want to sing, we got a 36 channel board. I can hook you back up. <laughs> amen? amen? I want people involved. I want people engaged. Amen? That's the way it should be. And we shouldn't do, we shouldn't uh, try to hinder that. Amen? We should actually foster 
that idea. Amen. Well, let's let's pray as we go go to the Lord uh, over the offering, but also these prayer requests that we've lifted up. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, and praise you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, Lord. Lord, thank you that we have an opportunity to bring our request before you, Lord. And we know that you already know what we have need of, God. So as we come, we come in faith, believing, God, that not only do you know, but that you have the answers. And that you are the answer for every problem that we face, every struggle that we're going through. And God, we know that you have given us all things. So as we come and worship for you and to you this morning, God, we come expecting that we are walking right into your presence. So as we give this morning, God, let us not think we are just giving to earthly things, God, but let us understand as we give, we are giving as unto the Lord so that our worship is pure and from our heart. God, let each person give according to they have purposed in their heart to give. Let them give cheerfully. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in our giving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Can I get an amen? That was too quiet. Yeah, that, was, that, was a, that was a good spot for an amen. All right. Are you ready to record, boss? Or are you already? You're already recording? Man, I got a lot to cut out. <laughs> I have to cut the audio down, you know what I mean? You don't want you don't want a whole bunch of things going on uh, that people are like, I don't understand what's happening here. You just want the message on the podcast, you know what I mean? Because it's easier <laughs> and less confusing, amen? Uh, anyway... This morning we are starting 2 Timothy chapter 3. And for all of you who have a King James Bible, you can praise God that I got me a King James study Bible and I'm going to read out of it today, okay? And for those of you who don't, I brought my ESV anyway. So if you're totally confused, I'll try to get an NASB so I can read out of it. <laughs> no, actually I've got an NASB, but... We're going to read out of the King's English today, okay? Is that okay? How many of you understand that the original letters and the original Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek? Y'all know that, right? So it, it wasn't written in English. It was written in Hebrew and Greek. So don't get all messed up because of different English translations. All you're, all you're really getting is a word-for-word -word English translation from the Greek, okay? That's why understanding where the Bible comes from is pretty important, okay? That's why understanding that the, the text that we're using is from an actual original Greek text. And I can pretty much go through here and tell you this isn't really in the Greek, that ain't really in the Greek, but they have to do it that way because we don't speak Greek. You heard the term, it's all Greek to me. What that really means is I don't understand a word you're saying, right? <laughs> so so we gotta we got to understand in our translation that that's what's happening. Amen? Uh, we may do a class on that. Just where does the Bible come from, okay? Because that would be interesting. I think a lot of people would be shocked at the, first of all, the, the scholarly, dedication it, it, that it takes to produce a Bible in the English language, okay? That is a endeavor that men spent their whole lives doing. You know what I mean? So you got to understand it wasn't something that they just sat down one day with a Greek manuscript and said, oh, I'm just copying it right over. It didn't work like that. Actually, somebody had to find the scrolls. No, they had them. See, the, but at time, at over a time, they had to No, they didn't find them. They had them. Those letters were delivered to churches okay. that kept them. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we had had ancient manuscripts of the New Testament, Old Testament, for years, for centuries, since the church began. This isn't in like one day, all of a sudden, they found these New Testament things, and then, then the gospel started getting spread. No, we had them. They were written back then. They've had them since then. There's record of them having them in 100 AD. So we know for a fact that these things were around. 
wasn't something they had to find. This was written transmission from actual sources right to us. That's why we can put our faith in knowing that the Bible we're reading is what they would have been re reading. Okay? There's no doubt about it. None. I can, give you, I can walk you through in a class of where the Bible came from. Okay? I think it'd be good. I think it'd be good. I think it'd be good for people to know that. I think it'd be good for people to understand the, the critical thinking that goes into translating the Bible. Okay? We might do something like that. That might be a good like Sunday night or Wednesday night thing. Amen? To go through that and see, hey, where does this all come from? Amen. But before we do all that, we're going to preach 2 Timothy chapter 3. Amen. Before we do all that, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I don't know that this might be another three, start three sermon chapter here because the, I thought it was going to be really simple because I'm like, I looked at it face level. I was like, oh, it's split up into two parts. Looks pretty simple. I'll go through it. And then I started making notes and I realized when I had two pages full of notes for verse 1 that it was going to be a long one. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so, let's read it, and then we're going to go back through and uh, digest it, okay? Oh, here we go. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort they are which that creep, excuse me, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lusts, never, or ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifested unto all men as theirs also was. We're going to stop right there. My King James Bible stops right there. My ESV Bible stops right there, and I was pretty sure the, NS, the, the NIV that I had stops right there as well, splitting this chapter up, because there's two subjects that are talked about in this chapter, first of which is false teachers, and second of which is going to be how we actually follow the scriptures. My King James has it split up this way, perilous times, and then all scripture is God breathed, because that's where we end up in the last half of this uh, chapter is understanding that all scripture is God breathed. Meaning this is my, that's why when we have our statement of faith and we walk through this in this church about what we believe about the Bible, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, unfallible word of God that is our rule for life and godliness in everything. That we don't, uh, I don't have to have a, uh, I don't have to have God come down with angels and voices just to hear, hey, don't steal, because his word says, don't steal. We got a lot of people going, you know, oh, is this the person I'm supposed to be with? Uh, are you with them? Then yes. Come on, yeah. That's right. Come on. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what the Bible, if you read the Bible, you don't have to ask that dumb, hokey, Pseudo spiritual. I got to hear a voice from heaven to know that I'm supposed to be with this person. If you're with them, first of all, if you're with them and you're not married and yet you're living and fornicating together, that's what you're doing. You're fornicating. And you need to stop and you probably ought to get married. Amen? Second of all, if you are with them and you are married, you don't need to pray and say, God, is this the person I'm supposed to be with? Yes! You're married. That's the one. Amen? Amen? That's the person you're supposed to be with. Okay? In most divorces, God still sees that person as the person you're supposed the, to be the with. The realities of this, just, just to clear this 
this up. God hates divorce. So why would you go, God, am I supposed to get divorced? He's going to look at you and say, no. If you have to, but he doesn't have to do that. And I hear all these people, I left my husband before because God told me to. No, God didn't tell you to leave your husband, okay? You're a liar. God ain't telling you to leave your husband, okay? Matter of fact, the Bible says even if you got an unbelieving husband, the wife should stay there because her faith could possibly save her husband. Amen. Amen? Amen. The reality is that we've made this other level of spirituality that somehow usurps the authority of Scripture. Somehow, I got this, I got, I woke up with indigestion and I thought that God was telling me to do this. Even though it goes against what the Bible says. Somehow that kind of pseudo-spirituality is acceptable today. But for me to stand behind this pulpit and tell you that abortion is a sin or homosexuality is a sin. Somehow I'm wrong for telling you what God's word says. But somebody else Oh, that the Spirit told them this. No, that Spirit didn't tell you anything. If you've got a Spirit telling you something like that, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's another Spirit. And if it's another Spirit, you probably need to get saved. I'm just telling you. That's what the Bible says. I, I don't have all this holy stuff, okay? I laid it all down. I'm telling you, I laid it down. Because if the word of God isn't teaching me it, if the word of God is not saying it, if I can't find the evidence for it in the Bible, I'm not doing it. Amen. I ain't believing it. I ain't following it. Amen? Amen? That's our goal. That's our understanding of the word of God. Amen? That's how we're going to end this chapter. But starting out, he gives us a contrast of what false teachers or false Christians, whatever you want to call it, look like. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I titled this Perilous Times, False Teachers. That's just as easy as I could make the title, okay? Perilous Times, False Teachers. Now, we're going to start right here at verse 1. It says, know this. Anytime it says, know this, pay attention. Amen. This is not rocket science. This is just reading, right? Now watch this. If I was in the, if I was out there in the public and said, "Hey, look at that! What are you gonna do?" <laughs> people in the, people reading the Bible when he says, "Hey, look at this," everybody's like, "Who are we supposed to look at?" Well, what's he about to say? Okay, that's what you're supposed to look at. What he's about to tell you. Amen. Yeah. Stop making it. Stop making it harder than it is. He says, "Look at this." He's telling you. Listen to what I'm about to say. Amen? Amen? Now, he says, Know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, I've got stuck right here, and I wanna, I'm going to get you stuck here, too, because we're going to talk about the last days. Somebody tell me what the last days is. What do you think the last days are? Days before he returns. Nope. Yep. That's the. Let's go back to the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, what happened? Spirit of God came down, cloven tongues of fire, everybody spoke in tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. But Peter jumped up. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 2, okay? Because some people haven't tied this together, and I want to help. If you haven't, if you're one of those people who haven't tied it together, I want to help you tie it together, okay? Because he uses some very, very clear language when he's preaching to the men, those 3,000 men, right? Let's see. Now, if you will, we're going to go to verse 14 of chapter 2. We're going to start right there. It says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. 
Now what's he saying? He's saying the same thing Paul said. Listen here. Look at this. Right? He's telling you, pay attention. Now watch. Look at that. Yeah, will you look at that? For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Now, I want to stop right here real quick before we read this. Don't read any further. Just stop right here. I want you to understand that there's people out there teaching that we're still waiting for this. Okay, there's people that actually think we're still waiting for this outpouring of the Spirit. But Peter said, this is is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Now watch this. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Stop. So this prophecy is about the last days. Right? And just the verse before he said this is that. So the last days had to have started at the first advent of Christ, at the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This was the last day. This is the inauguration of the last days. And the last days wasn't something that necessary, wasn't just a prophecy of distant future events, but also events that were taking place in Paul's time, at Paul's time. Okay? So the last days began here. It ends at the second coming of Christ. Okay? So the last days, because we get this confused when we think of last days, somehow we just think of just like out in the future. No. The last days already started. If you can't tell it by the world around you, look <laughs> on. <laughs> just I'll, get a better prescription than your glasses or something if you can't tell that we're living in that kind of world, right? Anyway, let's finish read, let's finish let's finish this uh, little portion here of Acts. He says, And it shall come to pass in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And all my uh, servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out my spirit in those days, says the Lord, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens and signs in the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor, and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the glorious and noble day of the Lord's coming. Now note, even in this prophecy of Joel, there's a portion of it that's complete, and a portion of it we're still waiting to be complete. Amen? Amen. We know for a fact that the Spirit was poured out. Amen? So I don't have to look for some fresh new God's going to pour his spirit. No, the Spirit's here. Amen. I just need to realize that it's available Amen. right now. Amen. 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 For me, all those who believe. First of all, you're not going to get saved without the Spirit. Second of all, you're not, you're not going to be held to the day of uh, Christ coming without the Spirit. Because the Spirit is our seal. It's our down payment, our deposit, our earnest until we see Christ. Amen. 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 You can't even be saved without the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. We got to understand that Spirit is given to those who believe. Amen. Amen. How many of you believe? There you go. Now, the last days. The last days, according to the uh, Reformation Study Bible, on verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, flip back there to 2 Timothy says the last days is an era inaugurated by Christ's first coming and completed at his second coming. See note on uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 1. So I went to 1 Timothy 4 and 1 and I looked at the note there. And this is what it said. It said, in latter times, this is a future period, or this is not a future period just before the second coming of Christ. Rather, in keeping with the overall New Testament perspective, it is the era inaugurated by Christ's first advent and consummated at his return. And they give a bunch of verses for this. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, the one we just read. Amen? Amen. Uh, and then uh, Hebrews 
1 and 2, 1 Peter 1 20, 1 John 2 and 18, 2 Timothy 3 and 1. That was a reference from 1 Timothy 4 and 1, so they're both referencing each other. You see that? The end time tribulation has begun. I know people don't like hearing that. The end time tribulation has begun. First, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.17, 1 John 2.18, and will get worse as the very end draws near. Boy, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and verse 4. Okay? So, to clear up any misunderstanding, because, you know, when you watch movies like, uh, 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 oh gosh, Left Behind. Left Behind, yeah. When you watch movies like Left Behind, and they mix up a whole bunch of stuff, and you start taking left behind as your theological uh, background for revelation or the end times instead of the Bible, then you're really messed up because you think, well, the last days, we're waiting for those. We're waiting for it to get really bad. You know, no, the last days already started. It is going to get really bad. But the reality is that the last days is some future event. It's not true. The last days started at the day of Pentecost. He said, this is that which was prophet, uh, prophesied by the prophet Joel in the last days. So if they were in the last days, and, or if they got the spirit, they had to be in the last days. Amen? And if Amen. you're looking forward to get better, it's not going to until it occurs. <laughs> well, you know, there's actually debate about that, brother. I just want you to tell, I just want you to know that there's people out there that believe that we as the church are going to make the world a better place, and then he's going to come back. I'm just going to let you know. Different eschatology. The word eschatology means end times, okay? Well, <coughs> well if we could make the world a better place, we wouldn't need him. Uh, uh, well, that's, that, that would be my argument in a lot of areas, too. There okay. <laughs> now, I do want to read another note on this verse, okay? Because it's it's nice to have all these reference materials, and I'm going to use them. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, description of false teachers. This paragraph opens by signaling a contrast between the previous paragraph. Now, I want you to remember where we left off last week. What, what was the last thing that we talked about last week? He says, uh, let's go to verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. This was in the previous chapter of 2 Timothy. Able to teach, patient, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, this chapter starts out with... Uh, a contrast from hopeful optimism that they're going to get better to an understanding that some people are not going to get better. Amen. They're going to get worse. Amen. Uh, amen? amen? Now, in the church, people should be getting better. Amen. Okay? But we can't look into the world and have a great expectation that they're going to get better. Because they're not. Amen? They're depraved and lost and undone. Amen? Amen. So let's stop having Now, inside the church, my hope is our church grows in our understanding of Scripture, in our understanding of who God is, in our relationship with God, in our relationship with each other, in our witness in the world, in how many people we witness to and how. Amen? Amen. I want all that for the church. Amen? Amen. But I don't have this great hope of, of the world. Okay, now, I'm going to read this other note before I get myself in trouble. Yeah, yeah they're not going to come to their senses. They're dead. Remember, we talked about this. They, they love, don't know. They love, they, the they, they love the darkness. They're dead, and they enjoy being dead in their sins and their trespasses, just like you did before God woke you up. Amen. Amen. They don't know no better. I tell people all the time, stop being shocked that sinners sin. I mean, come on. That doesn't make no sense. Like, did you see that sinner, Tabitha? He sinned. Go figure. That's like saying that quarterback threw the ball. Uh, duh. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Come on. We gotta get. We can be theologically right and still be funny. 
it's okay. okay. <laughs> you don't have to throw humor out, you just have to use it appropriately. Okay, now, don't laugh at people, laugh with them. And if you do laugh at them, run. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> Uh, ESV says this on verse 1. Paul's reference to the last days, and he gives the Greek word, puts a present evil, it puts the present evil situation in solemn eschatology or end times perspective. As Acts 2.17 indicates, the last days began with the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. See also 1 Timothy 4.1. See, this, this Bible also references 1 Timothy 4, 1, which we went over this when we read through 1 Timothy 4. Remember? We got stuck right there and talked about the last days then also. Now he says thus, Paul predicts, uh, Paul's prediction of times is difficult, is time of difficulty that will occur in the last days is already beginning to be fulfilled even in his present time. So it's not just a day that we're looking forward to. It already started. Amen. And Sproul says that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Amen. The Bible would seem to indicate also that it's not going to get better, in my opinion. Okay. Now, I may be wrong on that, and someday my eschatological view might change. My end times view might change. I said, man, you see us winning the world right now. But... Right now, we're taking the message there. But I don't know that they're all receiving it. And that the world's turning around for Christian good right now. Hey, it, just, there's 8 billion people on this planet. Only 2.6 of them are Christian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of sinners out there. Right, right. Now, the, the King James reference Bible says this. In the last days are more than just a prediction. It is also describing what was happening in Paul's time, see reference 1 Timothy 4 1. <laughs> Amen. So you understand that all of these men, now I, I don't know if you know this, but there is a great council of men. Uh, I think it's somewhere as upwards of 30 scholars that wrote the ESD study Bible. Two of them are pretty well known, reformed, theological. Geniuses, if you want to call it that. You know what I mean? That's what they do. Uh, and there's about the same amount of people that went into writing the King James study Bible. Okay? You got, you got to understand there's a whole council of men who all study to find out all the nuggets that they can pull out of here to give to you. Okay? Uh, Matthew Henry sums up this whole thing this pretty much the same way, okay? Matthew Henry says this, the prophecies concerning the Antichrist as well as the prophecies concerning Christ came from the Spirit in both. They spoke expressly of a general apostasy from the faith of Christ and a pure worship of God. This should come in the latter times. During the Christian dispensation for those uh, for these are called the latter days. In the following ages of the church, for the mystery of iniquity now began to work. Now, Matthew Henry said this in 1745. Okay? This is commentary from then. He's saying the last days started then. And then, so we have a consensus of scholars for the last 300 years at least. And I go back farther. I figured that was far enough for you guys to get the drift. Amen. Amen. That the last days started at the day of Pentecost. Christ first comes, establishes the church, goes back to heaven, sends the Spirit, last days. Amen. Amen. And we're still there. Amen. 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 So I got a couple more things I want to read, and, and then I'll get over uh, this, this chapter, okay? And they've gotten worse and worse. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that it's getting better right now. Now, some people say, well, you know, we're not, we're not seeing an outright persecution. In America, we ain't. Everywhere else in the world, they are. Yeah. Don't tell that to them when you tell them that, oh, it's getting better, brother. Just, just hold on, it's getting better. I don't know that they would believe you. Yeah, don't worry about the Muslims tracking you down in, in Africa. 
Yeah, yeah, well, they'll make an argument. I'm just telling you. Matthew, no. here, Matthew Henry here in uh, 2 Timothy 3 1 says that these perilous times were not so much just threats of persecution from the outside, like being persecuted from Rome or unbelieving secular kinds of persecution, but rather, and he goes on to explain after this first verse what these perilous times are going to look like. The, the, the uh, persecution that's going to come is going to come by traitors in the midst of the church who are not truly born again. They just have the appearance of religion and not the essence of faith. Amen? So these perilous times that we're talking about, first of all, we understand that we're in them. Amen? <laughs> Second of all, that there's going to be these people that are coming in to disrupt, to uh, uh, overturn, to rebel. Amen? Amen? So let's look at some of the different uh, characteristics or, or personality traits or however you want to call it of these false teachers or false believers, okay? He says, for men win. What, what is he talking about? In the last days, men shall be lovers of their own self. How many of you can look out into the world and see that all the time anyway, right? Now, I want you to realize he's not talking about in the world. He's talking about in the church. He's writing this letter to Timothy, the pastor of the church, right? Listen to what he says. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Come on. Man. Disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Have, uh, hold on, I skipped ahead. Yeah, I totally turned the page and I didn't need to. <laughs> Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now I'm going to stop right there, okay? He gives a whole list here of what these people are going to be like. So I just started studying out some of these different things that they're going to be like. And we're just going to hit them like bullet points. And I'm going to tell you a basic understanding from all of the different resources that I've researched and what these, what these roles and what this is all about, okay? Lovers of their own self. Notice, first of all, verse 2. Have lovers of their own self, covetous. This what is covetous? Lovers of money or coveting other people's possessions. It's all a love problem. You see in this? Lovers of what? Lovers of their self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers. Amen. We see all these laid out here, okay? Uh, before I get to reading some more notes, I want to go through these bullet points real quick, okay? It says, let's start right here. Lovers of their self. Man becomes his own God. You see that? If I love myself more than I love God, then who am I really worshiping? Me. Amen? Amen? Men will become lovers of their own self. In the Garden of Eden, Eve was tempted with this very thing. Genesis 3 and 5, Satan said, and you will be like gods. Remember? When he was tempted Eve, he said, for God knows if you eat this fruit, you'll be like gods. Right? Amen. He's tempting her. He's trying to get her to switch her allegiance from worshiping God to becoming God. And any person in the church that's trying to take the message of the gospel 
and turn it around to be all about you is committing idolatry. Amen. Because I don't worship me, I worship Christ. Amen. And what he did, Amen. not what I do, what he did, Amen. what he will do. Amen? Amen? I worship Christ. Blasphemers. Oh, I, I skipped a whole bunch. Boasters. Boasters. Conceited. Blowhards. Self-centered. That's what a boaster is. Okay? Proud. Pride comes before a fall. Amen. And God resists the proud. Remember? Amen. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Amen? Amen. Amen. Blasphemers. The, this literal definition of this blaspheming means given to contemptuous and bitter words. Contemptuous and bitter words about God. Contemptuous and bitter words about Scripture. Oh, yo, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do my own thing. Well, you're not really a Christian. Sorry. Yeah. Hate to tell you. Christians obey God's word. Yeah. Or try to. And they don't get butt hurt when somebody tells them, hey, that's not what God's word teaches us to do. Amen. 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 A Christian's going to take correction and say, oh, I see that's what it said. Amen. Amen. God's word doesn't get changed just to fit us. Amen. 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 Let's keep reading a few of these. Disobedient to their parents. Now, this suggests that the apostasy that he's talking about is going to go even into the home where kids are not honoring God because they're not even honoring their parents. Amen. You see, apostasy takes many forms, and this apostasy or this falling away is going to be kids who are unthankful. Notice the next two words, unthankful, unholy. Why? Unthankful to their parents or to God for giving them parents that take care of them. Unholy, unholy in their idea of who their parents are, understanding the role that their parents are put over them for their good, for their benefit, and they should honor their mother and their father, as Scripture Amen. said. But they're not holy in their thoughts, so they don't do that. Amen. And therefore, they don't honor God because they're not honoring their parents. Amen. Without natural affection, natural love, God gives to men and women and to families. Men for women and each for family. Now this is a perversion. It's not necessarily talking about affections from one gender to another. It's talking about the natural order of how things should be going in a family where mother and father are honored, parents aren't exasperating their children, how love in that family unit is supposed to work, but they twist it. And at some point, and you can see this today, there's households that it's all about that child. That's it. It's just about them. It's almost like they're worshiping the child rather than leading and guiding and teaching the child. Amen. Amen. It's not all about the child. It's about the whole family unit. First of all, a man and a woman, it's about you and your marriage and what where you stand. Amen. More personal level, it's each person where they are with Christ. Amen. But where I'm in relationship with Christ and where I'm at in relationship with my wife and then where I'm at in relationship with my children, it's all got to be done the right way. The Bible expressly points out how these things should go. We don't have to question that. It's like we don't need that voice from heaven and the great big angel blowing a horn saying, hey, honor your father and mother. Amen. No, because it's right here. Amen. Amen. Second, let's keep going. Uh, truce breakers, people who will not agree. They're unyielding irreconcilable. They must have their own way. These are the kind of people that are in church right now. And then I've got to have my way. You know how many people have left this 
church because they didn't get their way. Amen. Because they didn't get their way. But I'm not here to give you your way. I'm here to preach the gospel. I'm here to teach the Bible. I'm here to help you guys grow into a part, uh, uh, into a, a, a worker for God that can go out to the world and be witnesses and do the work of the ministry. Amen. That's our goal. That's what we're here to do. We're not just here uh, to warm seats and and and, and have a, a social club, which social clubs are fine. But they all, everything has its place. Amen. Amen. And as a family, we should want our family to grow. Amen. Right? Amen. As a family. Now, you guys can grow your families. I think Carmen and I are done. <laughs> I think Carmen and I are done. Slanderers or false accusers, the NIV says, right? Or the King James says, false accusers. Slanderers, NIV says slander. In content, that means without self-control. Fierce means untamed or brutal. And I believe the NIV uses the word brutal. Traitors, people who betray others and cannot be trusted. Heavy, reckless, rash, acting without careful thought. Now, I wanted to bring something up, and I know people are going to like want to stone me now, but that song, The Reckless Love of God, I don't like the title, and I don't like the word reckless being used as explaining God's love, because reckless and God's love are not the same thing. Because reckless means rash or acting without careful thought. All of which do not explain what God did Amen. when he loved me and saved me. I was, he absolutely put careful thought into it. He, act, act, he, he absolutely was very purposeful, not rash or uh, um, uh, acting like a knee-jerk reaction when he sent Christ. It was Amen. planned. It was a purpose. There was a reason. Amen. Amen. So Amen. reckless. God's love is not reckless. Amen. God's Amen. love is purposeful and very profound. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, lastly, high-minded. This is lofty thoughts about self. Very puffed up and conceited. Amen? Now, I didn't write definitions down for the last couple ones. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's pretty much self-explanatory. You know what I mean? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Now, I've told you this, guys, over and over and over. I, when I hear this now, because I have read so much of Paul's writings, when I read him here saying, having a form of godliness, but denying the power, what I hear is they're denying the power of God that comes at salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Because you've got to remember, Paul's day, he's writing to churches that were being pressured by Judaizers to observe the law and that only through observing the law are you going to find salvation. But we know that that's not true. That by following the law will no flesh be justified. We're saved by faith in Christ and what he did alone. Amen? So these are the things that he's talking about. And if you want a reference for what I mean, if you go to uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Wow. Amen? So when he says here in 2 Timothy 3 that they'll have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, what they're in essence doing is they're trying to preach a different gospel. They're trying to preach a gospel without the blood of Christ. They're trying to. Do you realize that today there's a movement that's been going on where people absolutely refuse to believe that Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ died as an atoning sacrifice for your sin. They think that is ridiculous. Yeah, he wasn't. They believe he wasn't the Messiah. No, 
they, they want to try to say they believe in him, but they don't believe in that atonement sacrifice. God didn't do that. That's not what the Bible teaches. Really? How about the verse that says that he died as an atoning sacrifice Amen. for our sins? It says those exact words. Amen? It says those exact words. He died to save us from our sins. That's what he did. Amen. And they're trying to take that out of there. Therefore, they're preaching a different gospel. And we talked about this this morning, or yesterday morning, at men's Bible study, Galatians 1, and I believe it's 8, where he says, if I or another angel from heaven preach any other gospel. Amen. And before he says that, he says that there's, what they're doing is they're not preaching another gospel because there's only one gospel. But what they're doing is perverting the real gospel. Amen. And we got that in spades nowadays. Yeah. We got that in spades. Nowadays. Amen. Oh, even the Jewish people deny the Amen. Amen. Now let's look at this. I want to want to read a chapter. Uh, I am totally not getting through this whole thing today. Not even this. Not even this half. This is going to be crazy. Uh, go with me to. Uh, we're going to read verse two and three where he talks about this. He says that. Uh, I'm going to read it out of King James, and I'm going to read the note out of there. He says, For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truth breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And there's a note in here in the ESV Bible from uh, verse 2 through verse 5, and we can read verse 5. Also, verse 5 says, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And that's where we left off. And that's why I wanted to read this note. I wanted to, uh, to get you guys to where I was when I found it. I was like, yeah, that's a great way of explaining this. Listen. Uh, the ESV study Bible says, and the list of vices vividly describes the negative impact of those who were opposing Paul and Timothy. This list begins and ends with references to misplaced love. That's a big deal. People who are lovers of their self, lovers of money, and then lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, verse 5. You see? So the, the list of these uh, people's character traits is really misplaced love. Amen? Instead of loving God, they're loving yourself. Amen. Instead of loving God, they're loving pleasure. Instead of loving God, they're loving money or being covetous. Amen? What did the Bible, what did Jesus himself say? He said, a servant cannot serve two masters. Amen. You'll either love one and hate the other. Or you'll love one and despise the other. We can't serve God and money. And you can put anything else there you want, okay? We can't serve God and our children. We can't serve God and the world. We can't serve God and, amen? God has to be first. And here's another point that I wanted to make out of this. Right here in the King James Bible, it says that, uh, where is it? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Not just rather, and I know the NIV, I think, says rather. Yeah, it does. The NIV says lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I like the word more here because it's giving you the emphasis of why it's a bad thing. Yeah. Amen? Because it's not, it's not evil for me to love God and love you. Amen. I just can't love you more than I love God. Amen. Amen. The point is, these people, it's going to be evident that they love their stuff more than they love God. It's going to be evident that they love their self more than they love God. That they love money more than God. They're going to talk about their self uh -huh. more than they talk about God. That's that boastful part. They're going to talk about uh, all their great accomplishments walk in pride rather than talk about what God did for them. Amen. Amen. They're gonna they're not gonna have natural affections where where their household is in 
where it's supposed to be at, amen, yet all the while they're going to try to be an elder and teach you, okay? That's why an elder must have his whole house in order to be an elder. That's why. Because I, I can't have my whole house in, in disarray and come in here and think I can lead the house of God. Amen. Amen. But these people that are coming into the church, Paul said, these people are going to come in and this is what it's going to look like. Amen. So I don't get too worried when people leave and get upset. Come on. Amen? Amen. We got to understand, I want this church to be healthy. Amen. Yes. And sometimes, something's got to go Amen. before it can be healthy. Amen. And we're going to start off on the right foot in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why he ends this chapter with that. All scripture, God breathed, and useful for what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Okay? We like teaching. We don't like rebuke. We don't like correction. We very seldom like training. <laughs> hey, amen? amen. <laughs> Come on. Am I the only one? I've been training for MMA. I hate it. And uh, there's a stigma there that I'm never going to do it again. Why? I don't like it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's understand training isn't always easy either. That's right. Amen. But we have to know how to spot people who are not really following Christ. That's Paul's purpose in 1 Timothy. Paul's purpose in 2 Timothy has not changed. He's trying to help Timothy as the pastor in Ephesus to see the difference between those who follow Christ and those who don't. Amen. What's the difference? What's it look like? And Christians, if you say, man, some of that stuff, I'm on that list, just pray and say, hey, God, help me not to be that guy or that lady. Amen? Amen? Understand we're not all perfect, we're not all sanctified, we're not all done right now. Amen? We didn't just come up here and pray a prayer, stick a Christian in the oven, and poof, five seconds later, it comes out whole, ready to go, right? Amen. That ain't the way it works. But we need to learn from what the scripture tells us is right and wrong. And if we do that, we'll be able to spot them and we'll even be able to spot if we're walking in pride Amen. or blasphemy or anything else. Amen? Or anything else on this list. We need to be very observant for ourselves not to fall in that trap. Amen? Lastly, I want to give... Uh, this last verse, uh, last study note that I wrote down here, and then we'll close. Paul uses a common technique, emphasizing an item in a list by placing it either first or last or expanding upon it uh, more than the other items in the list. While Paul and Timothy's opposition have the external appearance of godliness, they do not have its real essence. Power means the present effective working of God through the believer's lives. See note in Acts 1, 8, godliness means genuine piety, including holiness, reverence, faith, Love and devotion to God. In first or in Second Timothy chapter one verse seven, Paul linked power to the presence of the Holy Spirit, and this power enabled perseverance through suffering and faithful and, and faithful defense of the gospel. You're not going to have a faithful defense of the gospel if you're lacking the power of God in salvation to truly know what it is you're even talking about. You gotta know it. You gotta have the experience of being born again. Amen. I know a whole bunch of people got Bibles in their house that couldn't tell you the gospel from a hole in the middle of the street. Boy. You know what I mean? Just having the Bible, not even just reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, has to reveal to you that this is what you need. This is where you're wrong. This is where I'm right. I mean, how many times you look at your kids and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And you go, why don't they get it? I told them a dozen times. 
Amen? Come on. Well, why do we expect you to know things that have not been shown them? Amen? The power of God is also the work of God in the human heart at regeneration. Amen? Amen. Amen. The people's reference, uh, the people reference, uh, reference in three, uh, Acts 3, or, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, claim to know God, but their lives are devoid of the work of the Spirit. Now, I've talked about this for well over a year. You know, I know a whole lot of people that claim they got the Spirit of God. They can speak in tongues, they can roll around on the floor, but there ain't no love in them. There ain't no joy in them. There ain't no peace in them. There ain't no patience in them. There ain't no kindness in them. There ain't no gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, goodness. None of that's in there. Oh, but I can speak in tongues. No, you have the appearance of godliness. The born-again experience has not taken place. Because if it did, there's going to be more evidence than just babbling. It's going to be a real life change. Help. Amen? Come on, I know. Now watch this. It says, the people referenced in uh, verse 1 through 9 claim to know God, but their lives are devoid of the work of the Spirit, which would have results and resulted in holiness, perseverance, effectiveness in advancing God's kingdom. Avoid such people. The King James says, turn away. Amen? Amen. So we're not, we're not supposed to just say, oh yeah, all you, oh, you uh, people that's just not really living for God, you just come on in here and be a part. Come on. He's telling you, don't do that. Come on. Turn away from them. They're not preaching the same gospel. They're not living the same way. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to walk in. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Amen. 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 What fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship do the children of God have with the temple of Baal? None. Amen. Amen. So when they're preaching a different gospel, you don't have to listen. When they preach a different gospel, you don't have to uh, let them keep uh, battling on. You just walk off and say, that ain't the Bible and I'm gone, Jack. Amen. Amen. Amen? They need to get on with their bad self. I want to say that all day, okay? <laughs> but we need to understand that it's okay to avoid people like that. Now, what I really want to tell you is avoid being people like that. Come on. That's what we need to hear. Avoid being people like that. Don't just go through the motions. If you ain't really born again, don't just act like it. Don't fake it till you make it. That, don't have, that ain't how it works. You're either in or you're out. Amen. 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 You either believe or you don't. Amen? Amen? You don't get to just make up the rules as we go. We talked about that, right? We got the rule book. The last sentence in this uh the last sentence here, it says, this is the only command in 1 through 9. This avoidance must most likely involves excommunication. We know what that word is, right? Excommunication is where we tell somebody you're no longer part of the church, right? And he's giving you reasons. To say this, 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 and this are pretty good reasons for us to say, no, you're not part of the body of Christ. You're not part of this body of Christ. Amen? Amen. We don't like to think about excommunication, but Paul, Timothy, Titus, James, Peter, they all had to deal with getting people out of the church who were being very disruptive or preaching a different gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yep. I'm going to finish this note. We'll be done. Although there may be, although it may appear to be a contradiction between this and exhortation in verse 22 uh, through chapter 2, 24 through 26, 
The point in 24 through 26 is to seek repentance from such people. However, Paul envisions those who remain obstinate and states clearly that there comes a time when such people must be excluded from Christian fellowship. That's a pretty big statement. Because you see in chapter 2, he was trying to tell you to reconcile those. Go back to them. Keep going to them, right? He said that, that the elder must be patient with them and correct them in love, right? Gentleness. So that they might turn back. But don't get discouraged because some people, and that's what we're reading in chapter 3, is the people who are going to remain obstinate and not hold to real, historic, biblical understanding of Christian faith. Amen. And when they do that, it's okay to turn away and say, nope, maybe you need to, uh, this, you know, I don't know if you're part of the church, but I know you're not part of this church. Amen. You know, uh, and it shouldn't be an easy thing to do that. It shouldn't be something that we rush into, but it should be something that we take very seriously, understanding that the gospel is what Paul is defending here. Amen. Amen. Understanding that the, the true born again, faithful gospel is what we should be preaching, teaching, and living. That's what Paul's trying to say. And if people are not willing to go through that and do that, then they don't need to be a part of the church. Amen. 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 Jesus said it like this. I don't know why anybody looks shocked. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. Amen. You either gather with me or you scatter abroad. Amen. Right. Jesus said, unless you deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, you can't even be my disciple. Amen. Amen. Some people are going to try to come into the church with a form of godliness. It's going to look good. It's going to sound good. They'll probably tell you all about how the Bible's written, how they, they know this and they know that. And they was in prayer and God told this for you. Be careful. Amen. Go back to the Word. Amen. Right. I don't judge people for what they say just because, oh, I don't like that. She said she heard from God. Let me go back to the Word. Amen? Amen? Go back to the Word. Ha, I love what Steve Lawson said. If you haven't seen that video that I shared a long while back, you know, where he said, save your prophetic pronouncements. He said, if you come in this door telling me you have a word from God, he said, you better be able to quote it chapter and verse. Amen. <laughs> That's all I want. Because look, I know all kinds of people that say, I heard from God on this, and I heard from God on that. And honestly, I can't wait to tell some other people that uh, they was talking for God when God didn't tell them to talk when all this other stuff shakes down. Because we need to stop taking it so frivolously that I heard from God. First of all, you want to hear from God every day? You want to hear from God every day? This is the proven method. This is the proven method of knowing that God said something. We pray about stuff that all I have to do is go read. I don't have to pray about that. That's true. Even, even giving. I, I heard period, and I try not to do this anymore, and I used to do it. Somebody asked me for help, a donation, this and that. Let me pray about it. Well, why do I got to pray about it? If I got the money to do it, and I can just do it. Yep. If I don't want to, I don't have to. Yeah. I don't have to pray about that. God said, you give, it'll be given. Amen. Notice he didn't say, if you don't, it won't. That's true. He did not say that. That's true. Come, on. Come on. But there'll be teachers out there that will try to say that's what it said. You're going to walk under a curse. No, nope, we ain't under no curse. I'm in Christ. Amen. I'm not under a curse Amen. in Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. Get that through your head. Get that through your head when somebody tries to talk to you about giving. You hear the preachers on TV try to talk about you going to walk in some kind of uh, curse if you don't give your tithe. You better turn them off. Don't watch them again. They don't know the Bible. Leave it alone. Just hit power. 
Shut it off. Amen? Yeah. Let's, let's stand. We're going to close. I'm rambling now. <laughs> but that's good stuff, though. Yeah. I mean, we need to know this stuff. We need to know who's really living their life with God and who ain't. And we need to know how to discern what is and what ain't. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And you're not going to get it in. You're not going to get it in prayer. You're going to get it in the Word of God where it shows you the difference. Amen? Yeah. So everybody hold your hand up. How many of you, how many of you understand the message today? Go ahead and put your hand there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I tried to have you do it opposite, because if I just said everybody hold, raise your hand if you understood the message, then you'd all lift your hand. But I figured I could confuse people by making them do the reverse. Praise the Lord. I'm excited about the next part of this first part of this chapter. I think I'm going to have a first Tim or a second Timothy 3, 1, 2, and 3. I think that's how it's going to end up. But anyhow, uh, can I get somebody else to close in prayer? Come on. You ain't got to be bashful. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, bring my brothers and sisters and everybody we have up 